listen, it's just hair. This is how it grows out of my head. It stands on attention all on its own and it holds the strength of my ancestors. It requires quite a bit of TLC, but at the end of the day, it's just hair. They are lips. Their fullness and beauty take up space. They are plump and fluffy like pillows. They make my smile golden and my kisses memorable. They help me articulate in ways you can comprehend. They help me utter words that open doors that were once before closed. They've become a symbol of womanly beauty. They are lips. They are my hips. I'm not a piece of fruit. I'm not an apple nor a pear, but my hips do create curves. Your denim isn't made for me. And I've grown okay with that over the years because I got these hips from my mother who got them from hers. They are my hips. This is my voice. It cuts through silence like a Japanese blade. It commands respect. It speaks truth. It's heavy and weighty like good cooking. If you've ever truly heard it, you are affected because it is not shy. It is not bashful. It is not timid. It shines a light on injustice. It shouts for those who are unable to yell for themselves. It makes brave, bold moves because it is cloaked in confidence. It understands my stimulus value. This is my voice. All of these things are still yet only a fraction of me. They represent the parts of me that you tend to see first. They represent the parts that you try to emulate. But because you are blinded by my hair, my lips, my hips, and the flavor of my voice, you don't see my pain. You overlook my tears and you have no idea how hard I fight. Sometimes I prefer it this way because you never see me coming. The humanity that you don't see is my secret weapon. So please, please do continue to focus on my superficial traits and I will focus on my next move. By the time your eyes are clear, I will have slipped past you and extended a hand to the queens behind me. And you may not see it now, but mark my words. We are here. We are beautiful. And we are impressive. Thank you so much to Jazz Robbins for kicking us off with those beautiful and inspiring words. We really appreciate you. And we appreciate all of you who are taking the time to join us today for the Caring of Self and Each Other workshop. The Steve Fund is proud to host this event about support, healing, and empowerment for young women of color. And we are grateful to Dr. Tama for this wonderful opportunity. I am Monica Inkovet, Director of Programs and Partnerships at the Steve Fund. The Steve Fund's vision is that every young person of color is fully supported by programs, services, and institutional cultures that value and promote their mental health and well being. I want to take this time to thank Keenan Trust and Peloton, our funders, for sponsoring this important event. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce. Dr. Ocampo, provost at Trinity Washington University and board member of the Steve Fund, 
who will tell us why this focus on women of color is so important right now. Okay, good morning. Thank you so much for that. A very, very warm welcome. And it is definitely uh, a pleasure. I'm so pleased and excited to be here uh, with the Steve Fund and Dr. Tama Brian Davis to present this very important workshop. My name is uh, Carlota Ocampo. I'm the provost at Trinity Washington University in Washington, DC. At Trinity, we practice inclusive excellence and driving actions for racial equity. And I'm also a member of the Steve Funds Board. Uh, we are here today because young girls and women of color matter. And um, in addition to the, the work that I do in higher education, I'm also a health researcher. I've been specifically interested in um, the, the experiences of people of color living within systems of oppression and the impact on their mental and physical health. So I'm so pleased to say that um, this workshop is a product of many, many, many years of people coming together uh, to look at this, at this question very, very intentionally. So often this, our beingness and thriving and self-actualization in this society is disconnected and discounted. And you know, we receive all these messages that are that we should we should keep our, our most innermost feelings to ourselves and just put up a good front and a good face and, and try to do the best that we can and, and not let them get us down. But we know that so often all of the intersectionalities that we experience, and it's not the intersectionalities, it's the way that society is constructed to steer and guide our experience on the basis of those um, you know, superficial characteristics, as our poem just put it so well. Um, can, can lead us to not feel about ourselves as we really should, which is that we should understand that we are amazing and that we have the potential to transform our lives and to self-actualize. Um, we also know that public health initiatives must be led for, by those from within the community. So that also makes me so pleased and excited um, to be here to welcome you today. So could I have the first slide? I'm just going to talk very quickly about some of the unique challenges um, for young women of color. And you know, yesterday the New York Times published a big piece on um, the the increase in suicidality among uh, African American uh, youth, which um, got you know a very a big coverage, which was kind of amazing. But I just want to read this one paragraph that really jumped out at me that's relevant to our, our discussion today. Deaths by suicide, while more common among boys than girls overall, a study recently published showed that suicide rates among black girls increased by an average of over 6% each year from 20, 2003 to 2017, more than twice the increase for black boys. A diagnosis of depression or anxiety was more common among the girls. Additionally, nearly 20% of the girls had engaged in an argument within 24 hours of their deaths. So how can we prevent you know, these precious, precious lives from being lost? How can we help you know, young women to you know, get over the hump of feeling so depressed that they feel that they can't go on? How can we address their depression before it even starts? How can we take care of our own feelings of you know, when we begin to feel powerless and helpless and hopeless within, within our society, there are ways um, to, 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 to empower ourselves or to find the power that we have within to do this. Women of color often stand at the intersection of multiple barriers and the, the intersection of ethnicity, gender and disease is very, very relevant. Next slide, please. There are structural barriers that become systemic. Oh, okay, young women of color, and uh, women and girls of all races and ethnicities are more likely than boys to report emotional and psychiatric symptoms. We, we just heard about that. Um, women and girls in, of color in particular face unique stressors. And I'm sure I don't have to sit here and tell you what those stressors are. You could probably take out a pen and a pad or your computer or your notes and voice dictate into your notes and, and list 10 structural barriers that you probably encountered this week. Um, but um, how can we make sure that we acknowledge 
how intersectionality um, and these barriers interact. You know, intersectionality means that as you add more and more identities, um, you know, gender, sexual orientation, ethnicity, um, language, uh, religion, you know, all kinds of identities that we carry. As we add them together, sort of the, the influence of those um, in terms of how we address structural barriers increases exponentially. But you know what, so do our resiliencies. So do our resiliencies. There are a lot of resiliencies within each of these identities, but that's why they're important to us. So even though society may, may see us one way, we know that we're another way and we can utilize our intersectionality in ways that actually impact us for the good. Um, next slide, please. Childhood adversity is a huge issue for women and girls of color. Women and girls of color from every um, segment of our society are more likely to experience what are called um, um, adverse childhood events, we'll talk about that in a minute, than their white peers. And adver childhood adversity can have a lasting impact. Childhood adversity, events of childhood ad adversity, again, can exponentially increase the ways in which, as we present in the world, we are able to negotiate a variety of different challenges. Um, these traumas can also lead to engagement with the juvenile justice system, which exacerbates symptom symptoms because the juvenile justice system does not see mental illness, it sees criminality. And that's a huge, huge issue with what we might also call the criminal injustice system. Um, and so we need to, again, figure out ways to intervene uh, prior to um, mental health issues exacerbating to the point where the state becomes involved. Next slide, please. Trauma exposure, in fact, is a discrete risk factor for girls of color. So we talked about adverse childhood experiences. These are stressful life events that can be linked to long-term health and mental health outcomes. And again, there's a variety of stressful events that people experience and may respond to in a variety of different ways. Um, some with more resiliencies, but for others, you know, for whatever reasons, the buffers are not there. And ACEs eventually can produce toxic stress, which can have lasting impacts on me mental and physical health. And we know this. And these, um, these events, these experiences impact women and girls of color at a much higher rate, as well as when factoring in poverty, um, the rate increases even more. Next slide, please. So, we know that we um, have high rates of unaddressed mental health, but we also know that, and we for, for a variety of reasons. So sometimes some people don't seek services because um, they're afraid they might be stigmatized or they have received messages within their families or communities that you're not supposed to kind of take your dirty laundry outside of the family or the community or because their needs are unrecognized by providers, sometimes providers will not see presenting symptoms in someone who's saying, hey, help me. And also sometimes our society just says, you know what, this is life, just again, suck it up. But it doesn't have to be that way. Next slide, please. Um, we need to encourage our young women and girls of color and ourselves to engage with the mental health support that we need in order to be healthy, in order to thrive, in order to, in order to self-actualize across the lifespan the way that we want to, even with the very difficult circumstances that we encounter. So just framing a little bit the, the problem and the issue, we're going to turn to talk about how we can develop our resiliencies and our strengths to overcome some of these barriers and challenges and really shine and allow ourselves to be the beautiful, incredible, amazing, unique creations that we are in this world. And I'm, I'm incredibly, incredibly just can't even say how pleased and proud and humbled I am to introduce Dr. Tama Bryant Davis. So the amazing Dr. Tama completed her doctorate in clinical psychology at Duke University and her postdoc training at Harvard's medical centers, victims of violence program. 
She also coordinated Princeton University's SHARE program for intervention programs to combat sexual assault and harassment and sexual orientation harassment. She's now a tenured professor of psychology in the Graduate School of Education and Psychology at Pepperdine, where she directs the Culture and Trauma Research Lab. Her clinical and research interests center on interpersonal trauma and the societal trauma of oppression. She's a past president of the Society for the Psychology of Women, past APA rep to the United Nations. She served on numerous APA committees, received the APA's Distinguished Early Career Contributions to Psychology and the Public Interest Award in 2013, which let me tell you is no small honor. She has received many awards from important organizations for work in a variety of areas such as human trafficking, excellence in mentoring in the field of trauma, distinguished scientific achievement, and international contributions to the study of gender and women for her work in Africa and the diaspora. And she is also, a foundational scholar on the trauma of racism and has given an invited keynote at the APA annual convention on this topic. She's raised public awareness regarding mental health by extending the reach of psychology through community and media engagement, including many news outlets you may have heard of such as NPR and CNN. I also must mention that she's the editor of a wonderful text, an APA text on multicultural feminist therapy healing adolescent girls of color to thrive. Finally, and you know, certainly last but not least, because her best is yet to come, she's been elected the 2023 president of the American Psychological Association. Gives me tremendous pleasure and pride to turn this over to Dr. Tema. Oh, thank you so much. My heart is just warm and full. Thank you for that beautiful introduction. And thank you to the Steve Fund for sponsoring our event on today, creating this sacred space for us. And so greetings, my sisters and my non-binary siblings. I am so glad that we are here uh, from every culture and every community. And I want to even say of all ages that we advertised for young women of color, but I know uh, many of us are intergenerational, multi-generational, and all here for this important priority of thinking about our healing, our wellness, our wholeness, and the ways in which we can really occupy the fullness of our lives. And so I just want to start by saying, who will sing an upbeat Black woman song? Who will sing an upbeat Latina song? Who will sing an upbeat Asian woman song? Who will sing an upbeat indigenous woman song? We will sing it for ourselves because the downbeat says, the downbeat says they're so black or lazy or slack. And the downbeat says they're video hoes and of course academically slow. And the downbeat says they're so visible in welfare lines, but so invisible in the minds of shareholders, stakers and policy makers. But who will sing an upbeat song for women of color? We will sing it for ourselves. We will sing it for ourselves. We will put our souls in our throats, in our hearts, in our lungs, and sing of our survival. And the world will marvel at how long we hold our notes. And so we are gathered here today to give voice to all of the different experiences that have tried to stifle and mute our voices, our songs, our possibility. And we are here to gather at this well so that we would leave nourished, that we will not leave thirsty, but that we would receive everything that we need in order to go on the next leg of the journey. And I believe it is important to set intentions and so I invite you to consider in this moment what you are needing in terms of your nourishment, what you are needing to remember, to remind yourself or to be reminded by your sisters and your siblings and your comrades in this struggle, what you need to know from your ancestors, from your higher power, what you need to remember so that you can occupy your life fully and abundantly. And that is why we are here. I am so grateful that on a Saturday, with everything else that often demands our time and attention, that you put those things on pause and put yourself in the center. 
that we will not participate in our own marginalization and our own oppression, but that we will name and attend to our needs, knowing we are deserving of care. And that is a radical revolutionary act to recognize we are deserving of care. Next slide, please. So we want to really elevate our mental health and to elevate it means that I'm not just looking to be in survival mode, but that we want to thrive. And so shifting out of just getting through the day and I wanna recognize in a pandemic and with the realities of racism, survival in and of itself is noteworthy. And yet, as Dr. Corlato spoke about, we are here to do more than just survive. We are here to truly thrive, and we wanna think about that holistically, mind, body, and spirit. And I'm so glad for the Steve Fund and them framing this holistic priority for us not just to get caught up in intellectualizing, rationalizing, uh, to get caught in our heads and lose sight of our hearts and our bodies and our spirits. Next slide, please. So as we begin the presentation, it is important for me to name for you my positionality and the context in which I am sharing on today. And so my pronouns are she, her, and hers. I am a woman of African descent. And along with being a psychologist, I'm also an artist, a poet, a sister, a friend, a mother, a daughter. And it is so important that we resist colonial notions, false hierarchies that lead us to believe that to embrace our professional selves or our educated selves, that we have to leave ourselves behind. But you don't want to enter into any space where you had to leave yourself at the door. So I am present in the fullness of who I am. And I want to give a land and labor recognition to say that I live and work in a land that has been traditionally cultivated and contemporarily cultivated by the Tongva peoples and other indigenous peoples. We honor their heritage, their culture, their sacrifice, and uplift their rights. And I also want to give a labor recognition when people marvel at how quickly this nation was able to develop for those who are in the United States. And I know we have registrants from other countries as well, but in the US, we really accelerated quickly as a nation. And that was as a result of the exploited labor, largely of people of African descent. And so I want to acknowledge those who've cultivated the land, those whose labor is really foundational, not just for black history, but for US history and global history, for all of us to be mindful of the shoulders on which we stand. And then I want to name that we are living and meeting at this time during a socio-political climate of overt violence and oppression, as well as the realities of a global pandemic. And so some would like to pretend that it's business as usual, but I want us to take sacred pause and recognize in each of these boxes, and even though your cameras are off, each box does not tell the story. Each name does not tell the fullness of the story that it has been a, a, a plethora, a multitude of visible and invisible losses as a result of the pandemic. And then we are mindful of our intersectionality, multiple identities of oppression and the ways we have been affected by our institutions and on an individual basis. And finally, I wanna to say to you, I don't come on today pretending objectivity. And we know that this notion of being objective or neutral is false. We all come with our own stories. Uh, and so I come with my heart to say on today, while this is the area of my research and my study and my teaching, that my investment in the work is recognizing that our lives hang in the balance that our mental health and that our very peace and that our safety uh, hang in the balance. And so silence is not an option. And I want you to know that when I come today, uh, yes, uh, the data is important, but what's most important to me is your soul and that you uh, receive very clearly the recognition that there are a community of people who care about you, whether we know your name or not, that it is our desire that not only would you survive, but that you would thrive. Next slide, please. I love word and spoken word. Lucille Clifton, an African-American poet said, 
Come and celebrate with me that every day something has tried to kill me and has failed. And Layla Delia says, she remembered who she was and the game changed. <laughs> and I believe we wanna say amen, our woman, Ashe to that. The times where we remembered ourselves and everything had to change. And the incredible Audre Lorde wrote, I am not free while any woman is unfree, even when her shackles are very different from my own. And so as we think about the diversity of experiences across races and ethnicities and within racial and ethnic groups, we are also aware that our liberation is tied into each other's liberation. And finally, the Mexican proverb, which reads, they tried to bury us, they didn't know we were seeds. And so oppression is real, but our resilience, our resilience transforms the narrative. Next slide, please. So there are various sources of stress and trauma that you may face as a young woman of color. And for those who are supporters of young women of color to really understand all that the community faces, that includes interpersonal trauma. So we have increased risk of severe intimate partner abuse, uh, the highest risk being indigenous women and then black women. We also have increased risk uh, for sexual violence, both molestation as children, as well as sexual assault as adults. Uh, the greatest risk for domestic human trafficking, sex trafficking, child sex exploitation is of black girls, black adolescent girls. And we want to be mindful of our increased risk for community violence, school violence, and for those who are immigrants who have often experienced trauma, interpersonal trauma at their country of origin, when we think about war and refugee status, the violations that happen during migration, and then the violations that happen once they are here. Again, for those who are in the US, but also those who are gathering with us from other countries. We have increased risk for health conditions. A part of that is related to poverty. A part of that is also related to racism and our symptoms not being taken seriously and us not having access to quality health care. We face increased risk of financial strain. And so your story is not just your story. There are systemic con contributions to the ways in which we struggle economically, academically, and vocationally. And so at, while our white uh, siblings and friends and colleagues are more likely uh, to face transient poverty, temporary poverty, we are more likely to face intergenerational poverty. And so when you are lacking resources and those who came before you also faced barriers to resource access, we face increased risk of discrimination, oppression, microaggressions, which even though we have that word micro, we know there is a cumulative effect. When these events listed in isolation may seem minor, but when they happen over and over again, the impact can be devastating. We also face increased risk of loneliness, both on our jobs or in communities where we are underrepresented on college campuses, and also often romantically in terms of who is held up to be uh, desired or prioritized or respected. Uh, we face challenges around our relationships. So you may say it doesn't level uh, go to the level of abuse or violence in all cases, uh, but the ways in which we experience stress and strain of just trying to maintain friendships and trying to build and maintain romantic relationships. We face the realities of toxic workplaces, being in places where we are not welcomed, where we are quote unquote tolerated. And I want to say while tolerance is better than intolerance, uh, the ultimate goal is really respect. You can tell when you are in a place and people are just tolerating you because they can't do anything about your presence versus when you are valued, celebrated, and respected. I know many who are gathered are facing academic pressures in the midst of a pandemic, but on top of that, when you are in a school setting that does not believe in your wisdom, in your knowledge, in your genius, in your possibility, we face conflict in families, and for some of our uh, immigrant community members, uh, we hear even more so about intergenerational conflict. 
uh, as we deal with the realities of acculturation and assimilation. Uh, we have the gender role strain, these messages about who we are supposed to be, and often those messages are about caretaking, which can be uh, a beautiful act of love and service, but the challenge becomes when it is to the neglect of ourselves. And for Black women, we have this notion of the superwoman uh, syndrome where we are supposed to be super strong, to be able to take care of everyone else and to not have any needs ourselves. And then we deal with the realities of the imposter phenomenon, which some people have called the imposter syndrome. And with that, we want to be mindful that your feelings of inadequacy or insecurity did not begin with you. That often we have been in environments and been bombarded with messages that question our worthiness. And finally, I want to say, along with our contemporary challenges, we face historical trauma, which some people talk about as intergenerational, and we also have named as ancestral wounds. So what are the unhealed wounds that the people who raised you held and how that affected you? What are the unhealed wounds that have been passed down from generation to generation as a result of the realities of hate crimes and violence and attempted Jewish genocide? So we want to be really thoughtful about the weight that we carry on our shoulders because sometimes we're not even tuned into it ourselves. Next slide, please. So we wanna take a poll and find out from you about your stress and trauma. Next slide, please. So what source of stress or sources of stress are you currently facing? And we're gonna ask that you check all that apply. So whether it's COVID anxiety, racism, sexism, other forms of oppression, such as heterosexism, ableism, uh, religious intolerance, facing financial stress and strain, relationship problems, issues with your dating partner or your spouse, uh, issues in your friendships or with your family, tension at work, academic uh, stress, school stress, or health problems, which may be uh, COVID related or, related or other health challenges that we face. So I'm going to ask you now on your screen to check all of the different sources of stress uh, that you are currently facing. All right, and we want to take a look at our results. And so when we're ready, if you can put them on the screen. All right, so 54% of us are dealing with COVID anxiety, understandable, 67% racism, 33% sexism, 30% other forms of oppression, 68% financial stress, 64% relationship problems, 44% tension at work. 57% uh, academic stress and 44% uh, or 49% health problems. So I want us to take a moment to really take in one that you are not by yourself, that for every item here, no response was 1%. That for each item, there are those who, even if their ex experiences are not identical, that they can relate. And that for uh, all of us, I would say there were multiple forms of stress, types of sources of stress that we carry. And so for us to have compassion for ourselves in this moment, that it makes sense the ways in which you have struggled in, in school, at work, perhaps in relationships, in your health, um, as we look at the weight that we often carry. All right, next slide, please. So when people uh, in society look at young women of color and see us struggling, they often respond by saying kind of what's wrong with them? Right? Why do they have a bad attitude or why um, are they late or why have they not done this or done that or why are they speaking in that way or why are they angry? 
Uh, but a trauma-informed person would say, what happened to you? It's not what's wrong with you. And liberation psychology, which comes out of Latin America, we understand the construct of problematization, which is that you are not uh, the problem at its root, right? At the root, it is all of the things that we are having to face, often without support or with minimal support. And so then we would say not only what happened to you from a cultural standpoint, but also what happened to your community and what continues to happen. And that question gets raised by uh, the inclusivepsychologist.com that put out uh, important work about mental health and underrepresented communities. And then from a liberation standpoint, we ask the question, what happened to you? What happened to your community? What continues to happen? And how can we combine our psychological knowledge, our health knowledge, our knowledge of education, along with your cultural resources so that you can not only survive, but thrive. Next slide, please. So racism and sexism combined is called gendered racism. So there are some specific ways in which you are targeted, and some specific ways in which you are stereotyped as a result of not only being a woman of color broadly, but particularly uh, for Asian women, for Latinas, for Black women, uh, for Indigenous women, the specific assumptions that are made and the specific barriers and challenges that we face. And so you may face the limitations of what I would call a colonized curriculum. And so if you are in school and when you are told these are the great thinkers of our time and they are all white cisgender men, that is a colonized curriculum. It is a curriculum that denies the brilliance, the contributions, the wisdom and knowledge of people who look like you. Uh, there is a lack of representation that we also face when you think about your field. You know, who are the supervisors that you have had who are the faculty members or teachers that you have had? Who are the people that you have seen that do the work that you desire to do? And many times when we have not seen ourselves reflected, that often becomes a barrier and recognizing that's just not a psychological barrier. It is a systemic barrier when we talk about institutionalized oppression. We also have the realities of tokenism where people want your face in the place or they wanna put your image on their brochure or their website to say we have diversity, but they don't actually want your voice. They don't actually want your ideas. They don't actually want you to transform the environment. We also face this pressure uh, to not only when we experience violence, but when the violence comes at the hands of members of our own community, which is a cultural betrayal, often we face pressure to not report it to not talk about it because people will say, you know, these systems are already uh, unjust, which they are. And they will say there's so many stereotypes about our community. So you don't want to let people know more bad things about us. And so then who is left holding the weight of these wounds? And there being a lack of accountability when the harm comes from another member of the community. We also are more likely to be overworked and underpaid. Uh, we often think about the prison industrial complex and mass incarceration of men of color, but we want to also name the realities of mass incarceration of women uh, and non-binary people of color. We are mindful as well um, about working in places that will make statements like stop Asian hate or Black Lives Matter, but then not have follow through. So we can become exhausted by people wanting to be applauded uh, by very surface level uh, change, which is not change at all. Uh, we face the realities of people not knowing uh, about our experience and our cultures. And as a result of that, uh, feeling as if we do not belong. We face the realities of adultification so uh, young people of color, when you make mistakes or when you made errors in your teens and your early 20s, you're often given less grace than a white person who of your same age made a similar er error or mistake. And so you may be more discouraged to drop out of a major because people assume you don't have what it takes. Whereas for a white student, they may put forward more effort in telling them, I believe you can do it. I'll, I'll meet with you for extra hours. I'll invest in you because I can see greatness in you. 
And when people cannot see greatness in us, that creates another form of oppression. I will say this even shows up in pornography, that pornography with women of color is more likely to involve violence. Uh, so people's fantasies and pleasure being baked into seeing our pain. Next slide, please. So we also face racism and sexism in the workplace, being less likely to be hired when we look at applications. If the, if the resume is the same and just the name is changed to an ethnic quote unquote sounding name, we are less likely to get interviews and less likely to be hired, even though the credentials are the same. Uh, often in the workplace, feeling like you have to defend yourself or your race or your community, not being mentored uh, really costs you in terms of your professional and academic career, having to cope with the microaggressions and with discrimination, dealing with the realities of isolation and exclusion, and being aware uh, of the multiple forms of oppression that show up can also create stress. Next slide. So there is the emotional labor that you face. And for those who are students, I know quite a number of you who filled out the poll talk about academic stress. You deal with covert and overt oppression, as well as being denied access to resources or even being told about opportunities. Uh, and in response, when you do speak up, uh, you can feel like I'm defensive and then people uh, will label you in a particular way for being angry or having an attitude or being distrustful when it is just a reality of your environment. And so the experiences that you have as a student and how you are told to deal with or to ignore discrimination often set you up in your career to continue on that path. Next slide, please. So the wounds show up in terms of how we are affected. You may have experienced depression, including irritable depression. You might experience anxiety, anger, post-traumatic stress symptoms, which are like intrusive thoughts, thinking about it when you don't want to think about it, uh, feeling hypervigilant, uh, difficulty trusting yourself or others. Some of us deal with thoughts um, of suicide substance dependence, uh, fatigue, dissociation. So when you're present but not really present, kind of going through the motions, we're more likely to have somatic complaints. So you feel the stress in your body, migraines, nausea, backache. Uh, you might find that you've been having difficulty focusing or concentrating, facing barriers to resources. And then we even have consequences in our physical health increased risk for uh, death by COVID-19, increased risk for maternal death, uh, increased risk for cardiovascular disease, uh, increased risk for uh, diabetes. And so we want to be mindful of the different ways our stress shows up, including spiritually. So you may experience a loss of faith, a, tran a transformation in your faith, or an intensifying of your faith. So let's check in again with this next poll. Next slide, please. In the past uh, six months, how have you noticed your stress showing up? And again, you can check more than one, check all that apply when the poll shows up. So you can indicate if you've experienced depression, anxiety, loss of trust, loss of faith, increased use of substances, if you notice you've been drinking more, smoking more, uh, increased emotional eating or loss of appetite. So it can go either way with the depression or anxiety in your eating, trouble sleeping, physical symptoms like migraines, uh, trouble focusing or concentrating, which we know can be really challenging when we think about our experiences um, uh, in terms of school or work. So when we're ready, we can post our results. All right, 71% depression. Let's just take pause on that, right? In the past six months, that 71% of us have felt uh, the sting, the weight of depression. 80% feeling the anxiety, yes. 49% uh, loss of trust, 31% loss of faith, 21% increased substance use. Thank you for your honesty. 61% either increased emotional eating or loss of appetite, 
74% of us uh, trouble sleeping. So you know when you're exhausted, that affects the way you show up for life. 68% uh, physical symptoms, so the migraines or digestive difficulties, and then 81%, 81% trouble focusing or concentrating. So the stress has been showing up in our bodies, in our relationships, in our faith, uh, in our mental health. And so I am so glad that you are here and I invite us to take this moment of sacred pause and having compassion for ourselves for the ways we have been affected. Next slide, please. And so the negative effects can also result in us internalizing these negative beliefs about ourselves, which creates distress. So internalized oppression, internalized racism, internalized sexism is just when you come to believe the lies you've been told about yourself or your community. So if you struggle with thinking that you're not attractive, if you struggle with thinking that you're not intelligent or not capable, getting a sense of like where those messages really came from uh, so that as a part of our healing, we can also address our sense of worth and possibility. Next slide, please. We also want to be mindful that racism, sexism, and oppression can be sources of trauma. So there's everyday kind of stress, and then there's traumatic stress. Those are the events that kind of overwhelm our usual capacity to cope. So when you feel unsafe or when you feel overwhelmed, some of us respond to oppression in fight mode. So you're ready to march, you're ready to protest, you're ready to speak up. As soon as somebody says something, you, you have a reaction, you have an immediate response, uh, and, and you're gonna stay and you're gonna fight, right? So your job, there's racism and sexism there, and you're like, I'm gonna hold them accountable and make them uh, make changes. Uh, some of us respond with flight mode, where you're like, you know, it doesn't feel good for me to be here, it doesn't feel safe for me to be here, so I'm leaving this school, I'm leaving this job, I'm leaving this neighborhood, you know, any place that is not gonna feel uh, affirming or uh, where I am not um, uh, respected, then I can't stay, right? So some of you, that that is how you cope with the oppression is to get out of there. And then some of us cope with freeze. So you're physically present, but kind of mentally uh, absent. So you sit through the meetings or you sit through class, um, but your eyes are blank, you're kind of daydreaming, you're checked out, you're imagining what life will be like after this or picturing yourself someplace else. Uh, and so you're frozen. And sometimes when you freeze, you might feel guilty about like what I wish I said, you know, that someone did something totally disrespectful and I just sat there or I just stood there or I just laid there. And that can be the trauma response where uh, we, we are so stunned or so shocked that it's hard to mobilize. And uh, those who have the freeze response, you may also uh, be survivors of childhood trauma where you kind of learn the hard way that, um, it, that your resistance didn't work. So it was better to just kind of wait for terrible things to be over um, and uh, try not to draw attention to yourself. And then finally, some of us respond, and these are just four of the most um, noted responses, uh, with tend and befriend. So with tend and befriend, you try to figure out who has the power in a place, and then you try to associate with the people in power, even if that means that you have to um, isolate from other members of your community, or when you respond to other women of color as competitors, because you are trying to align or receive the favor of white people in a place or the men in a particular place. And so uh, what are the ways you have disconnected from or demeaned other women of color as a way of promoting or advancing yourself uh, as a survival strategy where you feel like there can only be one and I need to be that one. So we'll take a quick poll here to just check in. And you know, it's anonymous, so let's share in the face of oppression, what is your normal response, uh, your most common response, whether it is uh, fight, flight, freeze, or tend and befriend. What have you noticed you do most commonly? And just choose one.
All right, and when we're ready, let's take a look at our results. All right, so 28% fight, 33% said I'm out of here, 36% freeze, and 4% tend and befriend. And let's just let that sit there for a moment so we can recognize, first of all, none of us are by ourselves. And to know that these are, you know, how we respond to stress, to trauma, to not feeling safe. And we can, you know, idealize some responses, um, but we want to really have compassion for ourselves and think about how our norm has protected us and how our norm maybe has cost us some things as we think about circumstance by circumstance, um, the ways in which we would like to respond going forward. Next slide, please. And so we think about liberation psychology, which comes out of Latin America, and it is holistic. So I really wanted to highlight that as we think today holistically. The founder of liberation psychology was both a social psychologist and a priest. And so we think about our spirituality and our psychology. Liberation psychology pays attention to context. So Western or colonized psychology often will just look at you as an individual and say it's just about changing your thoughts, your feelings, your actions. But we want to see ourselves in context, our social context, our historical context, our political context, to understand the weight that we carry, to understand the ways in which we navigate these spaces and the ways in which we go forward. And so uh, some similar uh, approaches to psychology and to mental health come from uh, African-centered psychology, multicultural feminist psychology, social justice-oriented psychology. So I invite you to think about uh, not only your internal reality, but how the systems in which you live, the society in which you live, the multiple identities you have, have affected your wellness. Next slide, please. And so as we think about liberation and multicultural or intersectional feminist psychology or womanist and muharista psychologies, we want to know that those can be uh, our protective factors for us to uh, really approach our lives in a way that is both inward looking and outward looking. Sometimes when we think it is just up to the individual and it's just about willpower, we can set ourselves up for failure and a lot of frustration uh, because we are not equipped or prepared to recognize the systemic issues or the institutional issues um, and to address them and to also have compassion for ourselves, realizing what we are facing. Next slide, please. And so we want to attend also to our multiple marginalized identities. And so uh, one of those, of course, or two, gender and uh, racism, is I love the, the name Intazaki Shange, which means she comes with her own things. So I want you to know, based on your culture and heritage, you come with some healing uh, resources that are baked in, whether you have been taught them or not, whether you recognize them or not. And so we know that community support Social support is a part of our healing. Our spiritual practice is a part of our healing. Expressive arts is a part of our healing. Activism and using our voices and our power is a part of our healing. And to know we are not just aiming to decrease depression or anxiety or trouble sleeping, that's important, but we also want to thrive and flourish. Next slide, please. So it is a protective factor to begin to think positively about yourself, your culture, and your gender identity, uh, as opposed to it, believing the lies that you have been told about what it means to be an Asian woman, what it means to be Latina, what it means to be indigenous or black, but to really understand the idea of culture as medicine. But as I learn about my cultural heritage, it enriches me. And as I celebrate my womanhood or my non-binary identity, that is also empowering and protective. Next slide, please. And so healing our trauma 
Uh, it is a narrative approach. So you want to give yourself permission and spaces where you can tell your stories unedited and uncensored. Having places where we can acknowledge what we've been through, sharing our experiencing experiences, healing our trust, so discovering who we can trust and who we can connect with, having spaces to address internalized racism, internalized sexism, grieving the losses, what has oppression taken from you, and to know that it is okay to have anger. It is healthy to be outraged about outrageous things. And we have faced some outrageous things individually and collectively. And then we move not only to coping, but also resistance. So your coping strategies are important, but also we wanna figure out how to resist oppression and how to dismantle it to understand fundamentally justice is therapeutic. Next slide, please. So how do we cope and heal? Journaling is so helpful for us to be able to tell our stories, whether you then share the journal entry with someone else or not, using our art, uh, poetry, dance, song, theater. Your spiritual practices are important. Our social support, being in the presence of people who are calming and affirming. Bibliotherapy, so self-help books, and women are the biggest consumers of self-help books, but we can get a lot of information and often it's accessible, whereas mental health services sometimes are not accessible. And then looking at ways to calm ourselves with music, with aromatherapy, taking a walk. And let me say self-care is not just about getting our nails done, although that can be fun and wonderful, but self-care is also about setting boundaries. The way I care for myself is also what I say no to, what I refuse to sign up for, what I will not participate in. So I am protecting my mental health and my physical health, and that is a form of care. Mindfulness meditation and contemplative practice can also be a part of our spiritual and holistic journeys. And so I want us to go to the next slide, please. As we think about our healing, I have a, a model for womanist uh, trauma recovery groups for women of color, and we talk about it as resist to rise. What are the things I need to resist, to push back on, to reject, so that I can claim myself and, and rise? So fostering connection with others, consciousness raising, so I'm aware of oppression, using my art, my spirituality, and my activism can then help me to rise, as well as the psychoeducation. Next slide, please. So we also use our indigenous ways of healing. How have your mothers and grandmothers and aunties healed? And you might not think about them as healing rituals. Sometimes it's around meals. Sometimes it's around braiding our hair. Sometimes it's around music. And so embracing uh, our cultural ways of affirmation and healing and empowerment uh, can really be medicine for us. So what is your cultural medicine? Next slide, please. So we want to pause here now for our student panel, and I'm so glad to have Melissa and Naomi join me. And so we can uh, unshare the slides and uh, bring Melissa and Naomi up. Hello. Hello. Hi. Uh, let, oh, are you all there? We are. I couldn't see you, but now I can. <laughs> all, right. <laughs> all right. So I'm going to have uh, both of you first start with just uh, giving a little introduction of yourselves. So, Melissa, what would you like to share? Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Melissa Gavilanis. I am currently in my second year at the uh, clinical psych doctoral program at Pepperdine. I've uh, taken classes with Dr. Tama before and um, she's actually my dissertation chair. So we've worked pretty closely. Um, and I identify as a female, as a Latina, and I'm very happy to be here today. Wonderful, so glad you're here. 
And Naomi, were you able to unmute? No, we can ask um, our staff, our tech person, if you can unmute Naomi. Okay. Hello. All right, yes. Hi, my name is Naomi Bryant, she, her, hers. Um, I'm a senior at Towson University in Baltimore, Maryland, currently studying psychology. I'm a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. Um, yeah. Excellent. Thank you. So glad you're both here. And I want to first ask you both if you can share um, major sources of stress that either you personally have experienced or other young women of color that you have interacted with um, have faced. And I'll have uh, Melissa start. Right, I think um, personally, I have experienced some major sources of stress. I know for me, um, within my own personal life, financial stress has been a huge kind of aspect of my educational journey. Um, you know, especially um, pursuing higher education. Uh, there's less and less financial aid often available to students. And so that has always been kind of something in the back of my mind that I've had to overcome and really had to work hard to find solutions for. Um, I'd say another kind of source of stress for me personally, but also that I've seen other kind of women of color within my programs experiencing is this idea of imposter syndrome. Do we really belong here? Um, are have we earned our spot in this place? Seeing other students with maybe more privilege who have had um, better or, or, or other opportunities um, kind of succeeding and where we feel like we're struggling and really trying to acknowledge, is that a difference in privilege or is that a difference in ability? Um, and I'd say lastly, just this socio-political climate that we're currently living in has been very difficult um, for people of color, for women of color, and I wanna say, to um, you know, the Latinx community, um, there has been a lot of discourse and a lot of um, unfortunate language being used to describe uh, Latinx individuals and that has personally affected me and other women of color and how we feel safe navigating different spaces. Yeah, thank you so much for listening to those. I appreciate it because uh, it's one thing to kind of have the bullets, right? If these are the different challenges, um, but to hear how that has shown up for you. Um, and for other uh, Latinx individuals. Uh, Naomi, what would you share? Yeah, I have some of the same um, type of stressors, you know, like some of the normal college things, like what am I doing after I graduate? Um, I feel like as women of color, there's like a, a pressure to succeed and succeed quickly. Um, we don't have like the like the privilege of time really because it's like we have to excel at a faster pace in order to be seen as equal so that's something that's stressful um also like being a black leader on a predominantly white campus there's that added stress of maneuvering through white spaces and like how i'm being perceived like oftentimes i'll walk into a room and i'm that representation of my community for the campus and how i'm being perceived is like a reflection of like how my entire community is being perceived so that's an added stressor that i have and like representing my community well and you know yeah thank you for naming that as that is uh, an addi additional piece of the the weight of expectation right, the weight of responsibility, both holding the hopes of our community, um, but also when we are uh, the only one or one of few that uh, people then make assumptions about the entire group. So feeling that, that weight and also being the voice, as you say, if you go into these meetings, this feeling of, if I don't say something, nothing will be said, um, which is a lot of weight for a student and for a young person to hold, and yet, and yet we do hold it. So let me ask you both, how have you uh, noticed whether past or present, uh, these different sources of stress have affected you? And this time I'll start with Naomi. Um, it's definitely caused me to feel more anxious, um, you know, worrying if I'm doing enough, if I'm being perceived well, if I'm representing my community well, um, just carrying that weight of your community on your back when you do step into those spaces has caused a lot of social anxiety for me. Yeah, thank you for naming that piece. And I think a lot of times mental health professionals will just hear anxiety or social anxiety and not consider 
uh, the cultural and gender aspects that are contributing to that or that are causing that. Um, and so, yes, I appreciate you naming that piece. And Melissa, what would you say in terms of effects for you? Yeah, I'd, I'd say I've had a very similar experience to Naomi, where I think a lot of the stress has manifested through anxiety and the worry and the fear of, of how I'm going to kind of continue to navigate these spaces um, effectively. And, and something Naomi said was the idea that we have to work harder to kind of get to the same level as our more privileged peers um, has left me feeling very fatigued and very tired and um, very kind of needing to be more aware of what I need and what my body needs. And, and so that has kind of been something I've been both struggling with, but navigating as well. Yeah, um, I'm so glad you named that fatigue. You know, there's the notion of racial battle fatigue being in environments that are draining, but then also the emotional labor of representation, right? It is a lot. So I wanna ask uh, you both now, how do you cope? And I'll start with you, Melissa, this time. Yeah, um, something you spoke to earlier, Dr. Tama, was the idea of self-care. I, I think especially this semester, it's been very busy, have been really trying to kind of listen to my body and when it's telling me I'm tired because you know we, we have to keep going, you gotta get your assignments done, you gotta see your clients, you gotta do everything and somehow also be better than your peers to prove yourself. And so I think for me, I've, I've been really trying to engage in self-care, um, but also been trying to surround myself in spaces where I see others like myself where I can safely kind of communicate my experiences and listen to others' experiences and just feel that sense of community of others like me. And, and that has been very uplifting for me. Yeah, yeah. community yeah. makes it different. It really does. And Naomi, how, how do you cope? Um, I like to reset. Like I really like to go home and like be surrounded by family. Um, sometimes being on campus is a, is a lot. So being able to go home and reset and be like surrounded by that positive energy. Um, also I'm really big on like self-care, like grooming wise, like I'll take the time out and just like get my nails, toes, all that done so like I can feel good. Um, and then I'm not really a big journaling person. It's like when, that, when my mind is like racing because like I can talk faster than like I can write. So like if I'm up late at night and I'm like, I feel like all the intrusive thoughts like, oh, what are you gonna do? I just like talk into my phone and be able to release all that. And I feel like that's really helpful. Excellent. So important that home base, whether that is um, our, our home of origin or family of origin, or some people have chosen family where your friends become your family, but having uh, people who get you and where you can get around them and kind of get nourished. And I like that word to reset so that you're not so caught up in all those other dynamics. And so our last question for both of you is, you know, out of the uh, folks that are here and those who will catch the, the replay, um, there are young women who are currently really feeling overwhelmed, which is why they came on today. And so any uh, words of advice or encouragement that you uh, would like to offer? And I'll uh, start with Naomi. Um, well, this is something I'm still learning to do myself, but really um, taking a step back and like being present in the moment instead of like constantly worrying about like the future, being able to be like in the present in your space and be like, okay, what am I doing right now? And like really ground yourself so that you don't let like all the other external factors really like distract you from what you're doing in that present moment. Um, also recognizing that you are just one person. Um, even if you are walking to a space and you are the only one, you are just yourself um, and you represent yourself. Um, and just, yeah, being able to be present in the moment and knowing that you have time as well, even though we do have that pressure to succeed and succeed quickly, um, giving yourself like some lead way and some grace and be able to take that time and put a pause on things and go at your own pace. Beautiful. Pacing, so important. And as you said, we're all still learning. It's a continuous journey. Uh, and Melissa, what would you add? 
Yeah, I'd like to echo, um, you know, what Naomi was saying. And also, I think finding the spaces and communities where you feel safe and comfortable, um, where you can uh, reset yourself and, and reset others and um, uplift each other. And I think oftentimes there are times where there are, those spaces aren't available, those spaces extra pressure, there is always the ability to create that space yourself. Yeah, beautiful. So the importance of creating those spaces, I'm so thankful to both of you. And I know our field is in good hands with you both being an undergraduate psychology major and a graduate student in psychology. So thank you for your transparency and willing to share on today. Beautiful. So you all, uh, we're gonna take a three minute uh, pause for the cause or restroom break or whatever you need, get some water or tea. And when you come back, we're gonna have some interactive exercises uh, as we look at our healing and our care. We don't just wanna talk about it, we wanna experience it. So we'll have a song uh, and the slide come up on the screen and we'll be back in three minutes. Thank you both. So if we can pull the slides back up, we will uh, go into some interactive exercises, some practices we can do on this journey of healing. And first I'll give our word cloud. So when you all registered, we asked you about uh, how you are affected by stress and the ways that you heal. So we're gonna uh, pull up those results. All right, so you all will see some of these here. Uh, you all like sleeping, reading, yoga, bath, meditation, relaxation, listening to music, walking. We got some people in the massage group, drawing, uh, singing. Yes, these are beautiful. Listening to podcasts, one of my favorites, beautiful. So we can see all of the different uh, forms of coping represented. And I hope one, you will have affirmation for the strategy you use to know that there are other sisters and non-binary siblings who use those. And then also uh, that maybe you'll consider some on the list that you don't usually do, right? Some of us don't really nap, but we could use a nap. Uh, some of us have not tried meditation, but to give yourself permission to try it. All right, next slide. And then when people talk about how uh, they feel uh, when they're using those strategies, it gives a sense of calm, a peace, helps us to rest and relax, uh, connection with nature, uh, feeling more joyful, right? Uh, feeling like you have an escape to be able to step away uh, from all of that, like Naomi said, to reset. Um, and so to protect our peace of mind, to gain clarity, uh, we need to have a uh, practice where it's not just something I do when I um, burn out, right? If you wait till we're exhausted and then say, oh, I deserve a day off because I work myself to the bone. We want to think about instead a way of living that is consistently caring, uh, where it is an approach to our wellness um, that I don't wait until I literally cannot get out of bed but whether it is a daily or weekly practice of caring for myself and caring for my friends and family and my community. There has been this kind of false dichotomy. I think where some people who are critics of self-care have said, you know, the issue is not self-care, we need like systems of wellness. And while I get that and I advocate for systems of wellness, I believe it is not either or, right? So some people would say, you know, if you're a young woman who's a, a single mother, you know, the issue is not just like that you need to light candles, you need a livable wage, you need affordable and safe childcare, uh, you need employment. Uh, so yes, and lighting that candle and taking a moment to yourself and that bubble bath can also be healing. So I invite you just as we framed uh, today to think about what are the systemic or institutional things we need, but what are also the things we can give to ourselves and to each other. Next slide, please. 
So as we think about our own uh, healing journey, let's start with physical. And so a part of your healing is becoming more tuned into your body. How do you know when you're stressed? Because your body is telling you, your body communicates to you. And sometimes we are so in our heads or we're so busy in survival mode that we have trained ourselves to ignore the body, right? So do you pay attention when you're tired or do you just fight through it all the time and uh, keep studying, keep working until it has a negative effect on your health? Uh, does it show up that in the morning when you wake up, you realize you've been grinding your teeth or getting these migraines? Uh, does it show up in your lower back, in your shoulders? Where do you hold your tension? Do you find yourself, when I'm with certain people, I feel tense and stressed. And when I'm with other people, I feel at ease. And so learning to become your body's friend, right? To, to stretch, to be aware of what's happening in your body is really important. And so let's first just, if you can go to the chat box, put what area of your body do you mostly hold your stress? So for me, it's like neck and shoulders, right? All that gets real tight. So let's all just go to the chat. If you can click that, I see neck and shoulders, shoulders, lower back, back, chest, jaw. Yep, jaw too. Lower back, jaw, neck, shoulders, chest, jaw, head, chest, upper shoulders, back, chest, neck, ears and forehead. Yes. Mm, mid back. Yes, yeah, stomach. The stomach is a big one, especially for anxiety, right? Chest, neck, migraines, head. Thank you all for what I like to call hips, holding the tension in your hips. Yes. Um, uh, thank you all for shattering silence. I like to say we shatter shame when we shatter silence to know, you know, we are often told how to present as if everything's fine. How are you? Fine. I'm blessed. I'm favored. I'm this. I'm that. I'm super. I'm amazing. Uh, and can we say, like, I'm stressed, right? Can we say, you know, it's all in my back, it's all in my neck, right? Uh, so body awareness is one. The next one are what's called compassion holds. So this is something I do with therapy clients, but it's also something we can do on our own. Some of it you may uh, see when you, if you take like a yoga class, but there are ways of kind of connecting with ourselves, grounding ourselves. And so I'll give you a couple of different options and I hope you will feel comfortable enough to uh, try them out. Your camera's not on, so no one's gonna see you to see what works for you. And if you don't wanna try them and you just wanna watch me, that's as, that is fine as well. So one compassion hold is one hand on your heart, one hand on your belly and taking a cleansing breath. Then compassion hold number two, one hand on the heart, one hand on your head. And I like to say in my cultural uh, tradition, this is my way of saying I got you, right? Because sometimes we're in some spaces where we're like, you know, you don't feel held up, right? So it's my way of checking and saying, I got you, I'm here. Then you can take that hand that's on your heart and put it at the back of your head. So one is in the front, one is in the back. Just experiencing yourself feeling held, feeling present. Another one is both hands on either side of your head, right? In a sense of just like I'm holding myself up. Yeah, giving myself compassion. Another one is the hug. So one hand on a shoulder, the other hand is on your ribs. Just hugging yourself, right? And then the last one I'll do is the butterfly. So those who do EMDR may know the butterfly. So I'm just crossing my arms and letting my hands rest. And the butterfly with EMDR, we would do like a little tapping there. Right? So just a way of soothing myself, calming myself, telling myself I'm here, I have you, right? So you can think about, you know, which resonate with you, what you, feel what, what feels good to your body and uh, using your compassion holds. Dance and yoga um, are also great ways of uh, connecting with our bodies and healing our bodies. For those who do yoga, I wanna definitely encourage you to 
uh, explore the cultural roots of yoga. You know, one of the critiques has been um, kind of the um, uh, the appropriation of, of yoga and then removing it from its cultural roots in terms of uh, within the uh, Asian community. Um, and so uh, that is one. And then dance. We love social dance. We love cultural dance. We love hip hop. Uh, we love praise dance. Uh, so African dance is uh, another. And I'm going to do a really simplified version, um, even seated, so that we can all be uh, aware in the bodies that we're in. All right. And so the rhythm for this one um, is right, right, left. So you're going to, uh, if it uh, aligns with your body, uh, right, right, left. So I'm just lifting my legs. If you want to really go for it, you could stand up, but I'm going to do it seated so it works for every person. So I'm just going right, right, left, right, right, left, right, right, left. Okay, so this is a Liberian cultural dance. And as I go right, right, left, it tells a story. So the first thing that we do is we wake up right, right, left, right, right, left, right, right, left. Uh huh. As you're waking up, I want you to think about what are you waking up from, right? Are you waking up from insecurity? Are you waking up from lack of knowledge about yourself, about your community? Waking up to your self worth, waking up to what are your dreams, not just what other people told you you're supposed to do, right? So then after we wake up, then we have the washing. So you're just taking the water by the river and you're going over your shoulders, right, right, left, right, right, left, right, right, left. So you can think to yourself, what is it I'm washing off? There's some stuff people said to me that I don't wanna hold on to it. There are some things people did to me that I don't wanna hold on to. There are some things, the ways people made me feel this week, yesterday, last night, this morning, I don't wanna hold on to it. Might be things they said that stung when I was 10 and I've been holding on to it, washing it off. And then we get dressed, right, right, left, pulling that shirt over you, right, right, left, right, right. So what are you putting on? Those from a spiritual standpoint might've heard the term, the armor of God. So they're going out into the world, feeling they have their armor on, for some of you thinking about your uh, cultural garments, that if I showed up in all my colors, <laughs> if I showed up in the fullness, right, they would not be ready. What am I putting on? Putting on my clarity, putting on my self-esteem, putting on my strength, yes. And then we just have to check out ourselves after we get dressed. You hold one hand as the mirror and I look boom, 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 right, right, left, right, right, left, that we celebrate our beauty, we celebrate our wisdom, we celebrate what we come with, that I don't shy away from who I am, right? So I can glory in my creation as a woman of color, right? Whatever my race, culture, ethnicity, I celebrate it. I see me and I celebrate. So you can move, right? You can move. There's, there's more moves to go with it, but I just giving you all a taste, just a taste. All right, so cleansing breath, stretching. You see my screen, can't see all of my, all my arms. <laughs> Come back down, that works for your body. Next slide, please. So then we think about the expressive arts and I'm so glad you all are having fun. We have to have fun. In my therapy office, I've had people, other therapists who are in my suite and they always say, I can't believe your area is trauma because there's always a lot of laughter coming out of your office. And I say, of course, we can't cry every week. right? <laughs> there has to be some space for joy. And I say that as a trauma survivor, there has to be some space for joy. Uh, so music is one, listening to music, writing music can shift your mood. I have one of my dissertation students looking at the therapeutic use of music among adolescents. You know, sometimes we look for music that matches what we feel. Sometimes we look for music that will shift us to another place. So this is a, a song I learned in Botswana. And um, actually, 
that's a different one. But maybe since I said that, that's what I'm supposed to do. So forget silence no more. I'm going to do one from Botswana. And uh, it says, we are one family and none can separate us. None can separate us. None can separate us. We are one family and none can separate us. No, never. Okay. So I'm going to sing it and then have you also follow me in sign. That's when we think about intersectionality, um, that we have uh, different uh, abilities. So uh, shout out to uh, our deaf community. We didn't uh, do sign today. Uh, but we will have, I'm sure, because it's recording, there'll be a transcript so we can share today. All right, so get your hands ready. This is an F, so that's for family. We are one family and none can separate us. None can separate us. None can separate us. We are one family and none can separate us. No, no. Never. We are one family and none can separate us. Uh uh. Separate us. None can separate us. We are one family and none can separate us. No, no, never. And we give ourselves applause and sign. Yes, 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 yes. So you think about, you know, who is your family, whether that's your cultural family, your biological family, your chosen family. Uh, we as women of color to be family that I'm not going to be, uh, I'm setting an intention, right? That I'm not going to try to betray my sisters or my siblings to, to uh, advance myself. But I actually believe we can all win. That quote that says, the sky is big enough for all the stars to shine. Right, I don't have to try to put your light out to make mine more shiny. Right? <laughs> All right, you can put the slides back up. Thank you for shifting it so people could see the sign. So that uh, is is uh, one of our uh, chants, one of our songs. Uh, storytelling is also um, a rich uh, additional aspect in terms of our healing and. Um, I won't go through the whole story because of time, but I will say in this uh, West African story, and actually I've heard it attributed to multiple cultures, um, but there is this eagle who has been convinced that it's a chicken and it's been raised like a chicken, taught to walk and talk like a chicken, to eat like a chicken. And an animal expert comes to town and tells it, you know, these chickens can't fly. You can fly. So it's time for you to be who you are and although he's hesitant or she's hesitant, finally this eagle flies and you know goes and has like this full life that they were born to have. And so I invite us to think about uh, the ways sometimes we have been taught, raised, or traumatized into uh, playing it safe. And I understand that, right? We all want to be safe. Some people, you know, we shy away from leadership because when you're a leader, you're a target, you're visible. You know, when, when you do incredible things, then there's criticism. Um, and I love that, Donna Marie, our home is not the ground, that's it. So like, come on and, and be shiny and be everything you're meant to be. I had a client who one, once um, kind of came to the revelation that she had kind of been stalling and sabotaging herself because she had this thought that it will be harder to find a mate the more successful I am. So she'd been playing small for years, like hoping her partner would hurry up and show up, <laughs> but he hasn't shown up yet. So you're gonna keep like stalling or you're gonna be who you are, you know, meet them on the other side. So let's think about um, the ways maybe we've been holding back or taught to hold back. Uh, so we, we're, we're eagles. And sometimes when I share that story, people say, well, there's nothing wrong with chickens. I didn't say there's anything wrong with being a chicken. It's just be who you're supposed to be. That's all. <laughs> all right, next slide. So we also know that social support is healing. One of the things that often gets left out of self-care workshops and workshops on combating oppression is our relationships. And whoever you choose to date or partner or marry will greatly affect your mental health. So I wanna to say to us with, uh, in an unwavering voice that you are deserving of love, you are deserving of respect, you are deserving of support, you are deserving of spaces where you 
uh, can be fully yourself. And when out of frustration, desperation, loneliness, we make choices that do not honor who we are, then it can set us back in so many ways. And we can have grace and compassion for ourselves because I think everyone here who is of some age has probably entertained something or someone longer than you should have. Uh, but I wanna say in this season, as you think about your wellness, to be intentional about your friendships, yes, but also about your romantic relationships that they are, that they are spaces that nourish you right, that it, it, they are spaces that help you to thrive instead of adding additional weight to your shoulders. So we want to be able to work on our communication. Sometimes we are um, driven professionally or academically, uh, but have not always been taught uh, tenderness, compassion, transparency, love. And so for us to be able to give each other thank yous and gratitude, for us to cultivate the ability to apologize when we get it wrong, we're gonna mess up, especially around these issues of oppression, but also in relationship, you know, can you say sorry? And then for us to be able to uh, express our love, right? I express our care for each other. You know, if in order to thrive, you had to become a stone and be hardened, it wasn't worth it. But, you know, the hope is if I can flourish and show up with a full heart, that's, that's the good stuff. Next slide, please. So activism is also a part of our healing, right? And there are many different ways to participate in resistance strategies. I don't do a hierarchy of one of them being superior to the other. Uh, but I would say for you to search your heart, your personality, your access, your life to figure out what, what works for you. So for some of you, it'll be protesting and boycotts. For some of you, you know, your act of resistance is in your discipline. So it might be your research. Um, it may be, you know, how, who you represent on that campus, being involved in these organizations. Rest is a part of your resistance because for women of color, our worth has often been tied to our labor. That um, both our family and the larger society want us to serve them perpetually and for us to never need anything. And so, uh, to take the radical revolutionary act to go and rest yourself. As my grandmother would say, go sit down somewhere. <laughs> you know, when we're all flustered, 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 we're, we're creating anxiety for the people around us. Some people would love us to go sit down somewhere. And even if they don't love it, you deserve it anyway. Uh, community organizing is a part of our resistance. Some of you might run for office, whether on your campus in these professional organizations or in governance. Uh, working around policy is a great way to get involved. For those who are parented, parents, to think about anti-oppression parenting. I want to raise uh, children that have an awareness of oppression and how to fight it, right? That they don't have to be silent on the playground or in the community when people are being mistreated. Uh, joy is an act of resistance. Love is an act of resistance. Embracing our identity is also an act of resistance. Next slide, please. And our spirituality, as I named, is also uh, an act of resistance. And so uh, we are at the time where I am to take your questions. Um, if we have time after the questions, I'll do the brief guided meditation. If not, nothing was lost because my podcast is the Homecoming Podcast. And I was gonna share a piece of a meditation, which is actually a whole episode. So you can listen to the whole episode, which is a guided meditation for people who have faced marginalization or rejection. Okay, and that episode is like 30 minutes. I was gonna give you two minutes. So you can go get the full 30 minutes. Next slide, please. So just before that, if you can go back one, what I would like us to do as you all are preparing your questions is if you can rub your hands together because we hold energy, we create energy, we hold energy. And even though you can't see each other, I promise you it still works because that's how energy works. I'd like you to think about one thing you need it more of within yourself. And as you claim it for yourself, you want to give it to uh, the other folks who are gathered here on today. So after you have brought that energy together to just put it toward the screen. 
doesn't matter if your camera's off, put it toward the screen. And so we are setting an intention, sending each other joy, sending each other love, sending each other peace, sending each other ease, sending each other community. Whatever we stand in need of, there's somebody else who needs it. And we just wanna be a blessing to each other. Cleansing breath. Thank you so much, and I'm happy to take your questions. Wow. Thank you so much, Dr. Tama. Can I just say, could we do this every Saturday? <laughs> I love it. I don't know about anyone else here. And, and you know, here I am as, as young as I am and as, as you know, much education as I have. And I just feel so renewed and, and blessed and, and, um, and re-energized to have been in this space and presence. So thank you so, so much. Um, we do have a couple of questions and um, we have about 15 minutes. So I'll try to... It's about four questions right now and some more might come in, but um, let's start with um, this question about how do you, what are your, um, what guidance do you give or how do you suggest women of color go about finding spaces where they feel comfortable exploring um, their identities and the impact sexism and racism has had on their lives. And I'll, you know, add like safely, mm -hmm. right? Yes. You know, yes. um, that's such a key piece. All right. So I, I love the, the question, including the word exploring, because it's, uh, you know, it's like finding the right therapist. Sometimes you got to get through some not good matches to find the right one. And I think sometimes what has happened is we try out one space. And if it was not embracing or affirming, we give up on the process and say, like, groups are not for me. The reality is whenever you're with a group of people, we show up in our humanity and our humanity is imperfect. And so um, there are spaces where the ideals may be the same, but it doesn't feel nourishing to be there. Um, so then this goes to that point about fight or flight. I can, I can decide when I'm in those spaces are the imperfections things that I think I could stay and try to um, collectively work on improving in that space? Or is that too much labor or people aren't open to shifting or growing or like that it feels like it's beyond repair? So you can check out uh, a big one I, I have often seen for women of color um, are book clubs, um, and especially in this season where a lot of people are, are doing things online. So that can give us like a common language, whether people are reading novels or self-help books or, um, you know, kind of more academic uh, sounding books. Um, but so book clubs are one. Another one is kind of like um, political action groups. Some people like to say, I don't just want to talk. We want to do something, um, which and I think it's important to have both places where we reflect and and uh, enjoy and places that we mobilize. So you have to kind of know what is what is it you're looking for. So it's a place where we can dialogue together. Is it a place that I want to do kind of advocacy and activism with? Um, exploring different spiritual groups. And I will say um, often there's this um, false assumption that religious groups will always be um, limiting and spiritual groups will be liberating. I'll say people exist as people exist. So you can find uh, oppression in a, in a spiritual group, like you could find it, you know, at a, uh, a church or a mosque. So it's just about uh, seeing when I'm in this space and when I leave this place, do I feel nourished and liberated and connected? Or do I feel worse than when I showed up? Because if I feel worse then, or if I feel nothing, right, then I don't want to continue to invest being uh, in that space. So I would say giving yourself permission to explore and uh, even if you see things that are challenges to try to see are people open to your feedback, right? So like um, my daughter's a high school student and she is um, heading up the Black Student Union at her school and their advisor, you know, pulled the officers aside and said, you know, when people come to your meeting, you all need to talk to them. Like if you just talk to each other, people aren't going to keep coming because they don't feel like they belong. 
you know, and my daughter and the other students were like, oh, okay, right? It was like it, it, it was a repair that could be made. It's just they weren't thinking, right? They were just talking among themselves. And some adults do that as well. You know, we get comfortable with our people and then new people don't feel welcome. Mm, great. Oh, beautiful. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm seeing some questions, a lot of questions. I'm going to try to organize them into themes. Okay. So there, there's, there's um, because we don't have much time and I'm wondering if even afterwards we could have, you know, some questions maybe available via, um, you know, the recording or some other venue uh, answering the rest of these questions. But we've got some questions specifically around liberation th psychology um, and how you focus on liberation psychology as you're training to be a psychologist or how do you bring that into therapy? Mm -hmm. Then there's there's a set of questions about, around how can I be unapologetically unap black in professional spaces and around, you know, or how do I leave white traumatized spaces because it's not healthy? Um, and then there's some questions about how do we raise up our children in this, you know, structurally racist society? So three themes. Got it, very good. <laughs> Uh, so in liberation psychology, the good news is the American Psychological Association just published a book on liberation psychology 2020. Uh, the co-editor is Lillian Comos Diaz. Mm. And so um, I would encourage you to check out that book. And she and a different co-editor are currently working on one on decolonizing psychology. So mm. maybe that will come out next year. Um, the, often in our training, we were not exposed to these articles so then or these books and so um but i would say that they're they are there some people have said to me oh it sounds like you all need a framework i'm like we don't need a framework the framework has been written right decades ago right? so uh it just has not often been disseminated and, and taught so i would say you know i would encourage uh, each person to um, uh, take a look at what I call um, culturally informed or culturally emergent interventions. So while cultural modification is good, um, to know that there are interventions that come from communities that are intended for the community, not as an afterthought. And so even if that wasn't like your traditional kind of um, CBT, EMDR, those have modifications which are important but then there are also like Chicano affirmative therapy, African-centered psychotherapy, indigenous psychotherapy. So to take a, a look at that literature. Uh, the second thing was about holding on to yourself or being unapologetically black. Um, I would say try to identify um, allies and some people instead of allies have talked about comrades or co-conspirators where you know people aren't just doing you a favor, like they're not just speaking up because it's you. It's, it's they're invested because it's the right thing to do. Um, so that even if I am underrepresented in the space, figuring out who else in that space kind of um, honors me, sees me, celebrates me, um, so that I will feel less isolated and alone. And then uh, that reminder that what I bring is not a barrier or a burden. What I bring is gonna enrich this place, right? This is dry. <laughs> Oh, so, 100%. you know, bring, bring the juiciness, bring it. It'll, everybody will like, like it better. Nobody oh, wants yeah. to be bored. <laughs> and then how do we raise our kids? Yes. So this is the part of, uh, one, recognizing that culture is, there's more to culture than cultural oppression, or more to race than racism. Mm -hmm. Some people, you know, just make it like it's all these terrible things, but to teach them about, you know, um, who they are and what they come from and the contributors and writers and uh, inventors and artists of their background, but then to also go to that next step so that they will recognize racism when it shows up or sexism when it shows up to have those conversations about, you know, this is what it, what it looks like and let's think about something you can do, you know, whether that is going to stand next to a kid who is being bullied and teased because of their hair or because their lunch, uh, they brought a lunch from home and people aren't used to the scent of that lunch and so start making jokes and people feel like now I can't even bring the food I like to eat. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, to raise children who are compassionate, who are tuned in, who are not just gonna go with the crowd um, in order to make other people feel bad and um, to speak up to uh, teachers, to administrators and also to you for them to know that you 
um, will have their back, that you will advocate for them and, and for other kids who are being mistreated. Mm, beautiful, beautiful. You know, and could I add, you know, instead of using with our kids terms like minority, we can use the term members of the global majority. Yes. And, yes. and that kind of language, because that is really speaking the truth and naming the truth. We are un so unfortunately at the end of our um, question and answer time, I think uh, maybe we have to a uh, two minute, I think we might have two minutes. Um, okay. Let's try one more in two minutes. Um, some, uh, there's a question about um, how can I uh, learn about how these, um, what, how this um, um, new perspective is going to impact the APA? Yes, so I would say um, following uh, APA on social media, um, a lot of times we are um, sending out the update. So for those who are not familiar, for example, um, just the Friday before last, the Council of APA voted 100% um, for a resolution to apologize for the role of psychology and the APA in promoting racism. And, um, and then also passed resolutions as it relates to um, addressing health disparities. Um, and so when these major actions happen, um, they are posted on the website, but it will be easier to find the links if you follow them um, on social media so that you can, and then it'll have the link so that you can read the fuller document. Um, so that will be one of the important ways. And then I would say, you know, getting involved with the different divisions can be helpful and create a smaller sense of community because the APA is so large. So there's Society for the Psychology of Women, um, if you're interested more in, or well, not more, but if you're also interested in culture and diversity, um, if you're interested in trauma, which is one of my areas, that's uh, Division 56. If you're interested in international psychology, you know, to take a look at that division so you can become actively involved and, and feel like you're a part of a more intimate community as well as, you know, the larger whole. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And could I also recommend to everyone who's listening to follow at Dr. Tama on Twitter, on social media, on you know all the social medias because you can also keep up with so much uh, APA and beyond as you can well see. And Dr. Tama, again, thank you. This has just been amazing. And I'm seeing some comments like, this has been the best web webinar I have ever attended. And I will be here next Saturday. And uh, when are you leading retreats? Send us your retreat schedule for 2022. So clearly, um, there is so much need for you to step into um, the presence that you bring and just and just you know transmit to these you know um, young people and and everyone who who really really needs to know how valued they are and how precious they are and how much um, their being here and their being able to self actualize matters. So thank you again. It's just been a real pleasure. Thank and, you. Um, Yes, and so I think uh, Monica um, Inkovet of the uh, Steve Fund is going to come on for just some final um, words here. Yes. Hi, hello, hello. Thank you, thank you so much, Dr. Tamer, for those inspiring words. Um, and thank you to the two student panelists, Melissa Gavilanes and Naomi Bryant, and of course to Dr. Ocampo uh, for moderating for us. Um, and to all our participants, um, we hope that you are walking away today with a sense of empowerment um, to be you. Um, just like Dr. Thema said, what we bring is going to enrich this place. I love that quote. Actually, I was writing down so many quotes throughout the whole thing. <laughs> so um, thank you so much. Um, so we hope um, you walk away with the resources. I don't know if I jumped in ahead of you sharing the resources or we're going to share uh, that afterwards. Yeah, I think it's for after. Okay, we'll do that. And so for um, everyone that joined us today, please do not forget to complete the survey. It helps us to know uh, what we want to offer you, like uh, similar workshops like this. Um, and please go to our website, thestevefund.org, for more information. Um, and also, for some of you who signed in early, um, it was about close to 300 of you, we are going to select 20 to give the uh, Amazon gift card. And um, hopefully we'll get that to you by the first week in December. Uh, thank you, everyone. 
Um, and, and thank you, Dr. Tama. Oh, thank you so much for having me. This has been a delight. I'm so appreciative of the work of the Steve Fund. And as you named, thank you so much to the students as well. Uh, in terms of resources, I mentioned uh, my podcast is the Homecoming Podcast. Uh, there are a number of uh, meditation apps. You can uh, take a look at Shine. Uh, the Shine meditation apps has some uh, meditations that are specific to uh, women and women of color and some meditations that are specific uh, to dealing with racism. Um, if you are looking for a therapist, and I would encourage you to explore that possibility, inclusivetherapist.com, Therapy for Black, Girl, for Black Girls, Latinx Therapy, and Melanin Mental Health are all directories, as well as, of course, APA, having um, a psychologist locator. Um, if you are in crisis, there is a text line. So if you can text Steve to 741-741. And for you to know that um, there are a, a community of people who care for you and who can relate and connect with what our experiences are. And so I just speak uh, blessings of rejuvenation over each of us from the top of our heads to the soles of our feet.